the, the rise in cloud computing was uh, fueled by years of innovation happening around uh, uh, abstractions for enabling monolithic applications that were deployed over a single uh, server to be spread across a heterogeneous set of machines uh, connected over the network. So these abstractions were uh, mainly centered around three aspects. Uh, first involving compute, uh, where, which involves uh, the ability to deploy compute workloads uh, as VMs or containers in a cluster of uh, servers or over a data center. Uh, technologies such as Kubernetes are now widely uh, recognized and used uh, to allocate uh, resources uh, across a cluster and pack uh, many uh, workloads or microservices. Additionally, abstractions such as functions as a service also enable dy dynamic scaling of compute based on the incoming demand. Next, uh, uh, network abstractions uh, to enable connectivity between these workloads deployed in a cluster using uh, virtual network overlays in L2, L3, and all the way up to L7 using service meshes. And finally, storage abstractions uh, to enable distributed storage um, across systems with distributed databases like Bigtable, Spanner, and cloud object storages. So these abstractions have hugely simplified application developers and businesses to scale up their applications uh, based on the demand and make deployments simplified uh, without worrying about the underlying infrastructure. So uh, enterprises typically use uh, cloud computing in the following ways. Uh, private cloud, where companies manage their uh, infrastructure themselves. Um, public cloud, where the whole IT infra is managed by uh, a single cloud provider, like AWS, Azure, or GCP, and so on. And uh, uh, hybrid cloud, which is a combination of uh, the previous two, the private and public cloud, to meet security, redundancy, and reliability requirements. And finally, multi-cloud, where uh, multi-cloud providers and, in addition, uh, private on-prem uh, are used to host business uh, needs of the enterprise. And uh, recently, we are observing a uh, number of organizations adopting uh, multi-cloud for uh, their business. Uh, and this is driven by various reasons, uh, such as uh, specialized services, that is, coming up of clouds that offer specialized compute, um, such as Lambda, RunPod, NVIDIA Cloud, with GPU capabilities. Uh, second is for um, cost, um, cost optimization and flexibility um, to make sure you're not locked into a single provider, uh, which might be more expensive down the road. Um, third is the global reach uh, to expand businesses across different regions. Uh, enterprise have to work with different providers to optimize their performance, such as latencies and so on. Um, uh, resilience to failures uh, and ability to switch workloads based on uh, any outages that occur in a single cloud. Um, and uh, regulations which uh, involve things like data residency where uh, where business need, need to uh, are need to require uh, to maintain the data pertaining to a, a particular uh, population within that region and um, oh, sorry yeah and uh, finally uh, recent applications like LLM serving or AI agents where there is a need to scale up uh, um, and uh, the, the workloads are allocated resources which go based on the uh, GPU availability across different clusters. So while uh, multi-cloud is definitely becoming popular, uh, multi-cloud communications, on the other hand, still rely on uh, multiple disjoint network islands, which are both uh, virtualized and legacy. So based on a Futurium survey, one of the barriers of true multi-cloud and hybrid cloud operations um, is, the, um, is the networking technology. So most, most traditional networking technology was built for an era where uh, the organization controlled both the hosting of the applications as well as the underlying network connectivity. But uh, these days in the cloud, applications can be hosted uh, anywhere, and network data flows uh, can cross many boundaries, uh, such as those of the cloud hosting providers, communication providers, and enterprise networks. So the major gaps for this, uh, for this problem are uh, threefold. So first is the divergence of perspective uh, that involves multiple stakeholders, such as the DevOps, NetOps, and so on. On one hand, the network admins, the, net, the cloud ops team, uh, need their systems to be stable and reliable as possible. They work under strict controls, and as a result, infrastructure networking tends to, tends to be remain stat static and uh, change on relatively long cycles. On the other hand, teams responsible for uh, software services, such as uh, DevOps, strive for uh, flexibility and versatility. Um, and unfortunately for this group, uh, provisioning application connectivity involves uh, multiple processes, multiple teams, uh, and involves compliance, identity, and asset protection, and so on. Um, 
Second is the lack of uh, adequate uh, or uniform abstractions. Uh, so today to connect workloads that are deployed uh, across public clouds like AWS, GCP, or IBM would mean uh, the application developer would need to create a VPC, uh, deploy VPN gateways, uh, allocate the subnets for the VPNs, and uh, configure the routing table uh, to, to make sure the, v the VPN gateways are reachable, and so on. Um, the, the underlying, the, uh, the resulting problem is the, uh, the deployment is very tightly coupled with the network configuration, um, and these abstractions are too low level that in, in terms of uh, IP addresses and ports, which could often change and uh, which would mean a lot of maintenance. And uh, finally, these abstractions are inconsistent across clouds, so uh, that involves a lot of learning curve. And uh, finally, the lack of interoperability. Uh, while there have been solutions to address uh, the lack of uh, uniform abstractions, uh, for example, uh, Aviatrix, Alcara, or Submariner, they uh, implement a private L3 overlay network, uh, which are um, which need to be uh, deployed uh, uh, completely in their network, and uh, they are not interoperable with each, with each other. The same is true for uh, application level uh, connectivity solutions like uh, Cilium, uh, Istio, uh, Scupper, and so on, that um, that's all connectivity between the environments of the same type and uh, are built as end-to-end -end solutions, which need to be deployed by the administrator or enable more coarse-grained connectivity. So ideally, uh, we would want to rethink the problem of multi-cloud application connectivity from a higher level. And, uh, and in this case, we present uh, the requirements for an ideal solution from an application perspective. So first is uh, the ability to, uh, to have controlled sharing of information about workload components on services uh, across different locations or different clusters. And second is the, to define the policy of the cross-domain communication flows the, between these workload components that are, uh, that are deployed across multiple clusters. Um, and um, third is to allow co connections to be uh, established without requiring uh, a special uh, privilege root admi or administrator or in the form of tickets, whatever. And uh, fourth is to ensure uh, security of the communication to, um, 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 and uh, fifth is to avoid dependency on a specific, loca uh, specific location's networking functionality. It could be the uh, container network interface or the uh, specific cloud networking. Um, and uh, the sixth is to minimize the dependency on infrastructural um, connectivity between these locations. Uh, either they, uh, there is a peered network or an internet um, between them. And finally, ensure that each component, um, um, each workload connection is, can be distinguishable in the data plane. So this is for uh, mainly to observe what is happening in the data plane and also to, uh, to know if something is wrong uh, and also to apply policies uh, at that level. So based on these requirements, uh, we propose uh, ClusterLink which is designed as a building block for uh, providing application level connectivity between, uh, between these applications. So uh, we designed ClusterLink based on uh, three principles. So first is uh, programmable where developers can configure and express connectivity needs using simple APIs uh, or uh, Kubernetes objects. Um, second is uh, it has to be open and extensible where uh, that is, ClusterLink is just a building block and not an end-to-end -end solution, and it can be easily integrated into existing solutions that need uh, multi-cloud or multi-cluster use case, and uh, in that way, it can be easily integrated and customized uh, based on the application that integrates it. And finally, connection-oriented, where uh, it doesn't actually d do packet forwarding, but uh, it works on connection-level attributes and establishes connections uh, at that level. So uh, as a first step uh, in ClusterLink, we, uh, we start with cross-cluster Kubernetes connectivity, where, it can, we, where we can establish uh, connections between multiple Kubernetes uh, clusters, applications running across multiple Kubernetes clusters, irrespective of the flavors of Kubernetes they are running, and irrespective of the, uh, the underlying CNI that is deployed in them and um, spanning different administrative domains. So it could be, uh, it should be able to be deployed as a CRD object as, as a, with a privilege, or it should be completely unprivileged. So um, that is our aim. And um, to realize this, we, uh, ClusterLink is, uh, is realized as an in-cluster gateway that is uh, responsible for handling application traffic according to the definitions um, and policies specified through uh, declarative APIs. 
So it is designed using uh, uh, widely known uh, SDN principles where uh, the network uh, control plane and the data plane are logically separated um, and each components are programmable by themselves. And uh, in principle, this separation allows uh, them to be scaled uh, based, on, uh, uh, based on the demand and uh, which, which brings in a lot, lot of benefits and easy, easy to use uh, uh, mechanisms. So we also realize a, a third component called uh, policy engine, which, uh, which applies policies or governance to the underlying communication that is happening, uh, that is being established by these gateways. So um, additionally, we also uh, define four entities that, uh, that are needed. For these four entities are the abstractions that Clusterlink provides for expressing connectivity needs. So first is uh, a peer, which represents the remote clustering gateway uh, and the necessary metadata uh, for uh, creating protected connections between them. Uh, second is uh, an exported service, uh, which uh, represents an application service hosted in a, in a local cluster and is exposed to a remote cluster. So this could be a pod, a set of pods, which are uh, defined as a service. Um, an imported service uh, uh, basically represents a remote application service that is running elsewhere. Uh, in, in a different cluster and is imported uh, to the present cluster where an application needs it to be. And uh, finally, policy, uh, which represents the communication rules that must be enforced uh, for all cross cluster communication at each clustering gateway. So uh, in terms of deployment, uh, clustering supports both the NetOps and uh, DevOps team by keeping their concerns separate. So, while uh, most regular operations like uh, importing, uh, ex exporting a service, who can access the service are uh, maintained by the developers in their namespace scope. Uh, administrators still have the control of which clusters can be paired together and have privileged access policies which, can, uh, uh, which are more organization scoped and can uh, veto uh, regular policies. So in this mode, uh, the clustering components are deployed in a, in a CL system privileged namespace. Um, and are made available to the local namespace of the developer. Um, however, additionally, we also support a completely unprivileged mode where the gateway components are uh, deployed in the in the developer's namespace and uh, can be uh, and there is no concept of uh, administrator involved in that mode. So uh, traditionally, networking policies are uh, are mostly known to be. Uh, IP address based and port number based. Uh, in cluster link, we designed them to be uh, an attribute based that are derived from their identity. Um, so the identities could be, the attributes could be peer level attributes based on the environment, location, uh, at the peer creation time. Uh, server le serv service level attributes could be the namespace, application, role, and so on. While the workload attributes could be the labels of the, uh, of the application or the pod that, um, that is accessing a particular service. Uh, so in this case, the policies could be easily concise and more expressive, like uh, only sales can talk to uh, marketing, production, uh, traffic should be within production, and deny all traffic from uh, a certain region or so on. And um, we implement uh, basic policies like um, access control, uh, load balancing, and uh, we hope to implement more in the future. So uh, the access control policies basically specify which modules or services uh, that are allowed to establish connections with each other. So by default, all incoming connections are denied to an exported service, uh, which is based on zero trust principle. And a policy has to be specified uh, explicitly to say uh, which, uh, whether we want to allow certain traffic to be accessed to an exported service. So to enable clear separation of uh, administrator and uh, developer set of policies, we have two access control um, policy layers. So first is a privileged or uh, privileged layer, which is the which is highlighted in the top. And then the, um, the next is the regular policies. Uh, while the privileged policy takes precedence, uh, always uh, based on, because that is more on the administration or uh, the organization scope. So for example, if, the, if a regular policy uh, allows a connection, while the privileged policy uh, says it cannot go through, then the connection would be denied. Additionally, we also support uh, load balancing and failover, where uh, multiple replicas of a service can be distributed across cluster, uh, across different clusters to be load balanced. So the schemes that we support right now are uh, round robin, uh, random selection, and static selection based on these uh, attributes that are defined by the service and workload. 
And uh, since we monitor the health of the peered gateways, uh, when uh, one of the services is unavailable, we, we automatically fail over to the remaining set of uh, services that are available uh, for, a given, uh, uh, for a given exported service. So uh, let me illustrate um, the flow of clustering with a, with a simple example. So consider two Kubernetes clusters which have uh, clustering gateway installed and are peered together. Now uh, let's assume that uh, two apps here deployed an app in the in the orange cluster and a service in the green cluster want to communicate with each other. Um, so what what happens is uh, in the green cluster, service A has to be exported first. Uh, so when this action is performed by the user, it undergoes a policy check and then it's exported. And this, this the export just means that uh, the service is recorded as an exported service in the control plane. Uh, and then uh, it means that it can be imported by other clusters uh, depending on their policies. So the, now the user belonging to uh, the, uh, the orange cluster now imports a service, uh, service A, um, and it now involves the clustering gateway at that cluster to contact um, the peer for uh, peer, in, that is the green cluster for service A, after the policy, policy checks allow it. Um, then the clusterlink uh, data plane establishes a data plane listener and um, which interacts with the local cluster to create a, either a local service or an endpoint slice uh, that, uh, that is a proxy for the remote service. So, uh, so this is when uh, everything is set up. Now uh, the actual communication has to happen. Uh, the, the app uh, communicates the local service. Um, and uh, when this local service is uh, contacted, uh, it, it then goes through a policy check whether uh, the certain app can be allowed to connect to service A, and then it forwards the connection to the green cluster. And similarly, green cluster uh, also knows that app A from uh, orange cluster wants to talk to it, talk to service A, and uh, checks its policy whether it can be allowed. And uh, once, once everything is, is good, the data plane um, the, uh, hijacks the HTTP connection and establishes the forwarding. And further communication between the apps go through uh, these, uh, this tunnel connection without any interference, and they are uh, encrypted using TLS uh, between the gateways. So uh, we implement ClusterLink uh, based on uh, Golang uh, um, and use uh, existing uh, well-known um, uh, data plane like Envoy, and also implement a very lightweight Go-based uh, L4 proxy data plane, uh, uh, proxy for the data plane. And uh, currently, we support uh, both unprivileged, that is, uh, we use uh, CLI for deployment and an API for, for uh, programming the clustering gateways, and also a privileged mode where we have a CRD operator to be deployed by in the, uh, in the Kubernetes clusters and have CRD objects to, to be interacted with. So there is, we are, we are uh, doing development to, to support uh, VM-based uh, clusters and also HPC clusters which are uh, running Slurm. And currently working with several ongoing uh, multi-cloud projects to, uh, to integrate uh, ClusterLink as the underlying networking fabric for them. So next we look at uh, the ClusterLink uh, deployment overhead. So we deploy, we, uh, we deploy ClusterLink across uh, two GCP clusters provisioned with um, either low bandwidth or high bandwidth servers. Um, we observed very negligible performance drop due to uh, ClusterLink deployment in the low bandwidth uh, cluster and uh, close to 15% drop in the, in the high bandwidth uh, cluster. Uh, however, ClusterLink uh, surpasses uh, uh, solutions like Scupper by a factor of close to 2x with, in, with respect to throughput. Um, uh, and uh, this is because uh, ClusterLink uses uh, a simple uh, MTLS-based connection multiplexing at the data plane uh, instead of uh, uh, complex AMQP, uh, L7-based AMQP data plane by Scupper. So uh, to conclude, I mean, uh, I have highlighted the need to rethink application connectivity in multi-cloud or multi-cluster setting and uh, proposed uh, abstractions to define uh, connectivity in high-level uh, terms and ways to implement it efficiently in the network uh, using ClusterLink. So ClusterLink is available open source uh, and uh, it can be used, tried, tried out uh, in your environment. Uh, so next I'll, I'll go through a simple demo uh, to, to demonstrate uh, how ClusterLink can be used uh, to, to connect to applications uh, across two clusters. So, um, yeah. Okay, okay I hope it's uh, visible. So, uh, 
so I just, uh, if you go to the website, uh, there is, uh, uh, first we need to install the clustering CLI, uh, which, which I have already done in my setting. And uh, once the CLI is installed, uh, uh, so we just create, do an IPERF tutorial where, uh, where the IPERF client is running on one, one cluster and there is an IPERF server on the other cluster. And we just want to connect both of them together. So, um, so I have done the steps until here where we create a kind cluster and uh, I have just deployed IPERF uh, in them over here. So they are uh, just two clusters here, kind client uh, and the kind server with IPERF client running here and IPERF3 server running in the other side. Um, so now I uh, want to deploy clusterlink. So to deploy clusterlink, I first need to create a, a fabric. A fabric is basically a root certificate uh, that uh, that both the gateways can uh, use to create their own certificates. So uh, first, I run this command uh, in the uh, in one of the clusters. So fabric can be run in in any of the. Uh, uh, it can be uh, delegated to another root authority if you want. So this uh, once the fabric is created, I run the peer peer create peer cert, which creates a certificates uh, for the uh, for the cluster named client. So this is done, and uh, I go ahead with uh, creating a peer cert for the server. Yeah. So uh, once the certificates are created, uh, I then do clustering deploy, uh, where I specify the name of the the cluster and then uh, how the ingress for the cluster is. So in this case, it's a it's a kind cluster, so the ingress is of uh, node port type. So, uh, so it's easy to deploy the cluster link uh, in one of the uh, cluster. So similarly, I do the uh, deploy peer in the, in the other cluster as well. And uh, we just check the uh, rollout status here for, the, uh, for the, data, the control plane and data plane components to be rolled out. So we just wait for them. So in this case, it's, it's, it's already rolled out. And uh, similarly, we do it for the, for the server cluster, which, uh, which is currently is still rolling out. So we'll have to wait for a couple of seconds, I guess. Yeah, and it's done. So, uh, so uh, until now we have uh, we have uh, deployed the application and then uh, deployed the clustering gateways, and um, and they are both running independently without actually aware of them both uh, 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 both each other. So uh, now uh, the actual process begins where we need to. Uh, create, uh, set them to be peers, and uh, what we need is uh, their uh, the the IP address or the of the load balancer or the node port of the other cluster, uh, and the port of the uh, where the clustering gateway is running, and uh, we just uh, uh, copy it here, and um, the peer is created for the client cluster, and similarly for the server cluster, the peer is created. And in, the, in, this, in this particular example, I'm using CRD objects for, for them to be created. So that's why uh, I'm using the kubectl command. And uh, um, so once they are, now they are both peered together. So now the, uh, uh, the actual export of a service has to be done. So in the server cluster, I specify that uh, NIPE of three server wants to be exported at this specific port. And uh, now this, uh, the service is exported. And uh, similarly, I, in, the, in the client cluster, uh, I go ahead and import a particular service. That is, uh, I say that uh, I want type of three servers from uh, the peer, which is called server. And uh, similarly, I have imported the service. So if you see, uh, let me go ahead, uh, before going to the policies, let me check service connectivity. Uh, it should uh, be denied, because I have not set up any policies right now. To, uh, so it's default deny. Uh, and then I go ahead and um, set up access policies, uh, which says, uh, in this case, it's, it's very simple. I say allow all uh, workloads to be accessible from both, uh, just to keep it simple for the demo. Uh, and then I, I do the, the IPERF3 again, and then it's, uh, it's connecting. Uh, it just, just runs for 10 seconds, so it'll just give the out output after 10 seconds. Uh, yeah, I'll just have to wait. <laughs> yeah. So it's now able to connect uh, both of them. So similarly, we have uh, um, 
So in this case, uh, yeah, similarly we have uh, demos that are set up for um, for more uh, realistic applications like BookInfo, where uh, you can uh, you can see they, you can deploy them in the cloud, uh, like either GCP or IBM cloud, and then uh, check how the load balancing works here. Uh, I'm not going into this demo, uh, but uh, this is something that you can uh, try out uh, by yourself. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's the end of my demo. So, uh, thank you for listening today. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I would like to take any questions if, if needed. And, and also, please feel free to contact me after this uh, session or, or later in case uh, yeah, you, you are interested in, in, in using ClusterLink. Uh, so the, the yeah so there are no new protocols so it's it's mostly uh, uh, higher level abstractions for all, all over existing protocols so we just use uh, uh, well known MTLS for the underlying data plane uh, we use XDS that is already used by Envoy uh, between um, the control plane and data plane so it's all well known uh, protocols so in terms of deployment there are no new uh, complexities or uh, um, or new, um, uh, I mean, uh, any, uh, uh, it, it, there is no new uh, things that are introduced. So it's, it's much easier to, for deployment and in that case. So it's mostly the higher level abstractions that uh, in terms of expressing who, who can talk to each other and how uh, uh, services can be accessed across multiple clusters. Oh, uh, can, can I get you? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> So in your demo, you had two clusters. So say if you had 10 or five or 10 clusters, would you have to go into every single one of them and connect every single one automatically or manually? Or are you planning to add some kind of, you know, once you have two set up, you can just have one join and it automatically, you know, talks to the other ones and figures it out? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, that's a good question. So um, so in this case, we, uh, we envision clustering to be the, just a building block. So in this case, we want it to be uh, just uh, expressing the the basic needs of uh, of, of point to point, but uh, but definitely those uh, the one that you're talking about uh, in terms of uh, scaling it up beyond clusters can be can be developed on top of uh, cluster link. So it's uh, it makes it uh, uh, more uh, uh, because we in this case we assume it to be more. Uh, Control sharing, but yeah, I mean we can we can definitely do that. We can scale across uh, multiple clusters, but right now we have to import each of these, uh, import them uh, from this. But uh, of course, automations can be done uh, on top of this. usage has this gotten? Who uses it? So currently we are working with uh, the UC Berkeley team uh, to, to see uh, clustering being deployed with their uh, multi-cloud projects. And also we are working with uh, the IBM cloud team uh, to see how it can enable hybrid cloud operations. Uh, so it's, it's, it's just active in develop. It's, it's more active in development. We are just literally just uh, Opening it up, <laughs> open source the repo right now. So we are working with many many people to to find the right use case, uh, right vehicle to take it uh, forward to. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> uh, a few a, a few questions actually. Sure, so. Yeah. I, I guess you still need to have the right connectivity in place, right? Um, yes. Do you have any requirements on making sure that the connectivity is private? Yeah. So that, that's a that's a good question. So actually, we are. Um, um, I mean, right now, uh, clustering is more in the high level connectivity. But uh, as you say, there uh, it has to definitely uh, uh, use the underlying. Uh, peered or private connectivity in case so we we are we are working with one more uh, project uh, that does uh, expressing connectivity needs uh, at at that layer at the cloud layer where uh, you want to program the uh, vpcs uh, the the vpes to 
to connect them together across the e-cloud. And uh, so once you have that and uh, cluster link in place, then uh, you can do complete uh, full stack uh, of, the, of the network. Uh, so currently we are just tackling uh, one part of the problem. Once we integrate our solution with, with the other uh, side, I, we hope uh, that can, uh, we can leverage uh, private connectivity and all that. And, and my last question is about the versions of the Kubernetes cluster. So let's say I'm running 1.24 on one, 25, 26. Yeah. Is, it, is it going to work? Yes, it, it yeah. will work, yeah. So okay. Because we are not changing anything in Kubernetes or assuming that. So we, we support both CRD and non-CRD based, so it should ideally work. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.